Let me, uh, so we talked about this, which I think is a main basis for understanding the structure of functioning. Let me talk about some evidence on these frameworks. So how do we proceed with this? There, there's a question that I'm arguing, and, and in fact, this model that I just took down, this model here is, you can think of it if you want, and I think it is correct to think of it this way, as a factor model. We think of these at least at a point in time on factors, that these factors are producing this thing here. It's a non-standard factor model, although there are plenty of versions of it around, where you're adding arguments like uh, the effort of the individual on the task and the goods that an individual brings to the task. So there's a whole structure here relating these inputs to these outputs, but nonetheless, uh, that's pretty well, uh, that's a factor model. And I'll show you some very simple techniques for estimating the model. Uh, okay. So first of all, what do we have? Rich panel data, multiple measurements on proxies. So we have lots of proxies, uh, lots of panels. We have sometimes hundreds of measurements on what are allegedly the same traits. You need to condense the data. Linear technologies are not going to capture the substitution other than the, a very strong kind of substitution, the kind you get from linear production functions. So you might want to allow for it. Uh, Nonlinearity and nonlinearity in measurement systems, nonparametric, and then the natural uh, I inclination of many people looking at the statistics literature in education is to use test scores and to say test scores are a good measure. But as I said earlier, any monotonic function of a test score is a test score. Value-added measures that are used widely, sponsored to millions of dollars uh, extent by the Gates Foundation, I think are fundamentally meaningless unless you can anchor them in meaningful outcomes. So, uh, and that's what we actually do in some of our work. And so there's an anchoring issue. Uh, the data on inputs and outputs are characterized by measurement, I already said that. And then, and this came up over the break, that what we really want to think of is to make this operational, obviously. And we can obviously have for each outcome a trait. And we can say, oh, uh, I'm touching the board. And so my trait of touching boredness is explaining my touching of the board. I mean, that's true, but so what? You really want to talk about uh, low dimensionality. And so the question about whether the capability approach is even able to address these questions is partly a matter of what's the dimension of this functioning space. So that's another question. And then uh, we, we, I'm not going to talk too much about this. We have a lot of work about selecting the dimension of these factor structures and then being nonparametric. So nothing here requires uh, linearity and so forth. This is the outcome equation I already talked about. That's the technology. I just put a shock in and so forth. So uh, the fact is you have a lot of inputs that are partly non, not measured directly, but we have measurement error. Uh, there's anchoring, and then there's endogeneity. And the key idea is to use multiple proxies for unobserved components. And this is what's sometimes called a mimic model. And uh, I can say this, that in this work with uh, Cunha and Chinak, uh, if we imagine doing factor analysis, we can allow for general non-parametric <coughs> factor models. So we don't have to assume linearity. We don't have to assume uh, strong functional forms uh, to, to get the estimates we're achieving. And there's non-parametric identification of the technology. But let me, and, and then we're going to identify the technology. I'll skip the proof. Uh, because it's fairly simple. It's published in Econometrica, so let me just go forward. Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> well, in this case it is. And if Econometrica didn't do any simple proofs, what else could it do? Sorry, I'm getting tired. L let me motivate, though, this procedure through a linear. Even though I don't need the linearity, let me get an idea to link it. And so what I'm really suggesting, and this is going to underlie a lot of what I'm talking about in terms of the structure of the relationships, how we actually proceed, is we have lots of measurements. So let's suppose we have measurements on a bunch of different factors, or to we think of as factors. So it's like I have a bunch of Ys. And what I have is uh, a bunch of uh, measurements that are dedicated, OK? So I, I want to consider a factor system. So let me give you 
a very simple notion of measures. And let me make my life very simple. So it's linear. Maybe the notation isn't simple, but the concept is. If you look at the, you have a bunch of measurements, m sub j, uh, with an intercept, and then you have a uh, uh, coefficient here. Let it be scalar, just to make it as simple as possible. And then we have some input shocks, a to j. So here we have this structure here. Keep the x's implicit. And these are measure-specific intercepts. So we can think of lots of different measures, but those measures are all manifestations of an underlying factor. So this is a standard measurement error model. It's also a factor model. And uh, these are sometimes called factor loadings. And I'm going to have many more measurements than I am factors. I'm going to have lots of measurements on this factor here. Let me make it very simple by some measures explain are related only to some factors. Uh, they don't have to assume that, but you have to make alternative assumptions if you don't. Uh, the factor means are mu j, the factor covariances are sigma theta. Okay? So all of that is, I mean, it's notation rich, but it's very simple. And I want to try to show how we can, uh, how we can identify this technology and all these outcome equations. So we have a system of measurements. We then have a system of outcomes, and I want to show how to relate these two. The measurements themselves can be outcomes. But from these measurements, we know that we can extract factor loadings. Just use any program. You go to Stata. You go to anything online uh, in factor analysis and basically extract the factor loadings. There's a question about how you pick the dimension of the factor model. We have a discussion. There's a paper by Anatsky in, the, uh, in Econometrica, that uh, applied journal I mentioned earlier, uh, but how to actually pick the dimension. We have another paper with a Bayesian approach. But so there are these techniques uh, for picking these models. But let me suppose we have the dimension settled and we have the measurement. Then out of that, I can get the factor loadings, right? I literally get the factor loadings. That's not an issue. OK. So everybody knows about factor models, factor loadings. If you don't, now's the time to say you don't. You don't. OK. Question. Your question was you don't. I just thought it was funny that he thought that what was in his notebook was very good. He did. <laughs> okay. Why you thought funny? So you're going to be a little of him saying what you don't know factor models? Take them out over dinner tonight. No. No, but I mean basically you've all seen the kind of permanent transitory model, which is a factor model. So it's actually a very simple uh, structure. So let me get rid of all the dense notation. And let me just assume I have some measurements. And let me call measurement uh, sub L on, uh, say, factor J. And what I have is I have a coefficient uh, on L, J. Uh, that's that's going to be an intercept term, alpha. I guess I have a nu, but sorry. And that's going to be a phi, J. Um, and that's going to be on theta, J, OK? Plus some eta, uh, J, L. So the key idea in the factor model, which is true in the measurement error model, it's a standard model. Oh, sorry. Uh, the phi j l is going to be the factor loading. Yes. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. But what's not subscripted here is the theta. This should all have individual subscripts on this. So this is going to be like, this is like a model of permanent income, right? So what I have is I have like income in each of the different years. Then I have permanent income here, right? Permanent income, and how permanent income maps into measured income each year, OK? And so in this literature here, I, I, let me get rid of the J's. I mean, everybody understands the J's implicit. And so let me get rid of it, because it's just a superscript. So let me just do this. That's I just have this one factor. And I'm going to get rid of this. This is measurement L. The simplest case to consider is the so-called permanent transitory model, right? And the permanent transitory model is saying, this is theta, and this theta has got multiple measurements. You know, I have something here. Uh, this is going to be mean 0. I'm going to assume that these innovations here are independent of this theta for each individual. So the measurement error is classical. I have this true, true component here with this measurement error. And the simplest way to proceed of course, in this framework here, would be to do something like m sub l. L goes from 1 to cap l. 
1 upon L, right? And that's going to give me something that looks like uh, uh, sum of the uh, alpha L, right? Uh, uh, L goes from 1 to cap L, uh, sorry, 1 upon L, plus, and then theta, plus something that looks like eta sub L, L goes from 1 to cap L upon L, okay? So uh, if I make a normalization, for example, that, um, so first of all, under my assumption, I can take averages over people, right? And I could then estimate immediately the mean of alpha L, right? So I know what the alpha Ls are. I might as well just work with the D mean version, okay? That's not a big deal. So let me just do that. So let me just get rid of some extra complexity here. I mean, there's estimation error here, and I got to account for it in forming the standard errors. But basically, I have this thing here, theta plus this thing here. So if, in fact, I have lots of measurements on the same individual, like income at different years, I can immediately estimate the theta for that person. Now, all the factor model is doing is basically saying, oh, uh, here's a phi. I believe that's phi, var phi, uh, sub L. And so for this particular measurement, this true factor is transmitted through this variable phi sub L. It gives me a different reading, OK? Now, the scale of theta and the scale of phi is arbitrary. I can just multiply them. So for one measurement, say, L equal to 1, I might as well just go ahead and normalize phi sub L, phi, sorry, that phi sub 1 is equal to 1. That's one way of just setting the scale, setting it off a particular measurement, OK? So if I do that, then the standard procedure for estimating the factor loadings, let me just lay them out here. So let me take the deviation. So let me call this uh, m twiddle sub L. And then if I have then the covariance between m twiddle 1 and m twiddle 2, what is that going to be? Well, under my assumptions, these eta Ls are mutually independent. That was my measurement error assumption. The theta is going to be dependent across all the measurements. In fact, that's the idea of the factor, that the factor is generating the dependence across all measurements. So that's, that's generating that. So if I take M1, M2, what am I going to get? The covariance is going to be nothing more than phi uh, 2, because phi 1, it's phi 1, phi 2, but sorry, phi 1, phi 2, but that's equal to 1 times sigma squared theta, right? Because by construction, these are independent across measurements. And so then I'm going to come up with this, and that's going to be the covariance between m tilde 1, m tilde 3. That's going to be phi 3, uh, phi 1, sigma squared theta, OK? And then the final covariance, if I have three measures, suppose that L is equal to 3, is going to be m tilde, uh, uh, so here's 1, 2, 1, 3, and here's m2, m tilde 3. And that's going to be phi 2, phi 3, sigma squared theta, OK? But I, both of these are equal to 1. So immediately, assuming these things aren't 0, so all the phi's are non-zero, then basically I could divide this thing here, which I can observe in the data, by this thing here, right? And that's going to give me phi 3. And symmetrically, I can get uh, uh, phi 2. And therefore, I'm going to be able to identify phi 1, phi 2, and by, since I know phi 2 and phi 3, sigma squared eta. And then I can just use the, the residuals, right, to identify the variances of each of these etas. That's factor analysis for the one factor. It all generalizes to a multiple dimension where I have multiple factors, but it requires some additional normalizations. But I just want to get to the, to the heart of what's going on. So you can see immediately how I construct the phi sub L. That's the factor loadings. So it's literally, the factor loading is just telling you What's generating the dependence across these observations? It's that common factor. So that's the idea. The big five, by the way, which, are, which I flashed by you a second ago, are all generated through factor analysis. That's, that's the way it was created by this guy, Goldberg. OK, now, is that OK? So I show you how to get the factor loadings. And it generalizes to multivariate cases with different normalizations. So here we go. I'm not even sure I need that, but it's somehow better symmetric. Not even symmetric, but just shows. Okay, so we know how to get this. I just showed you how to get the 
factor covariances. Because if I have different measurements on different traits, a bunch of measurements on different factors, then I can form the theta, right? And then I can actually form the covariances across the theta. Because if I use the first measurement for one theta, the second first measurement for another theta, that's going to give me the covariances. And I could scale through. If I know the factor loadings, I can go through here and basically <laughs> divide and get the covariances. So I get the, I get the covariances easily. That's a, that's a simple trick. He's closed. So now there's another idea, and this is due to a statistician named Bartlett back in the 1930s, that basically if we form the measurement system, say with cardinality of m cross 1, we can run the regression of the measurements on, oh, sorry, I've lost my pointer here for a second. So I have the measurements, and I just told you how to get the factor loadings, right? And because I had the factor loadings, I can run this regression here. This is orthogonal to this. So what I can do is I can actually look at the regression coefficients from this regression on the factor loadings to get the factors for the individuals. That's stage two. And uh, you know I can do something like a GLS. And then, uh, so that's it. And to get unbiasedness, I have to form, I mean, this is again, in the, this is the standard kind of GLS, GMM kind of achievement that I would run this kind of regression and I get an unbiased estimator of the factor by this thing, uh, by this result here. The third point is the following. So that's the unbiased estimator of the factor. So I can literally estimate the factors for each person from these multiple measurements. This is all a regression. This is all least squares regression that I can do, or GLS regression. So is that okay? Gauss-Markov, yes? The independent, you mean the, the these 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 eta L's? Yeah. Oh, but see, that's well, actually, <laughs> again, the paper with Cunha and Chinock, we show that you technically don't even need that, but that's kind of a refinement. Let me get to the main point. The intuition is that the what was the original motivation for factor analysis? It was the idea that there was a single unitary factor called G, and that G was explaining all the test scores, the grades of everybody across individuals. So all the covariance across scores was to be generated by this one G. G in this analysis here is like my factor theta. And the idea is that any other source of covariance, all the covariances would be generated strictly through a common theta. So it, it's just kind of a, a statement of what the model would be. If I picked up a second covariance, that's evidence for a second factor. OK? But see, this was testable, by the way. You'll notice that I could actually go through, even in the three case, and get some over-identifying restrictions. If I have more than three, I have loads of over-identifying restrictions. So this is not something I have to make up. I mean, I can literally test it. And I can add, do I need one dimension? Do I need two and three? And there are a bunch of different ways of doing that in the literature. We have this paper, hopefully will someday see in the light of day. God knows. It's one of the most cursed activities I've ever been associated with. But it's on, on picking the dimension. So it's, not, it's, it's something that's empirical. See, the key idea, though, it's like the key idea in a lot of science. If I, it's like my Aristotle joke. I mean, if I start telling you that it's of the nature of a thing, that it do the thing, and it's that nature that explains the thing, that's worthless. I mean, just like in models of economic preferences, this is very conceptually similar. We're saying risk preference, uh, ambiguity aversion, leisure, uh, maybe some time preference. Those four parameters are explaining a lot of behavior. Same thing here. We're seeing lots of measurements explained by theta. So it's really a way of the characterizing correlations. Okay? And this previous model that I put up uh, a second ago, even though it looks like it's a, it's, it looks like a weirdo version of factor analysis, um, uh, where is it? Yeah, this is really a factor model. It's saying those capabilities, because I have multiple measurements on each of those. So even though it looks very different, and I can be non-parametric, I don't have to assume linearity, I can do lots of things more generally, and I won't get into those details, not in the general lecture, but it's there in the paper, and you can do this. It still is a factor model. It just has multiple factors. So here I'm basically taking the notion that one factor is explaining a bunch, there are a bunch of measurements on a common factor. But typically, like in our study that we did on this British cohort study, we had like 130 measurements on the child functionings. And we had then, we, we end up with like 13 factors. And we find no evidence that an additional factor would explain anything more about the covariance pattern. So that's the notion of restriction. 
So literally, if you count equations in unknowns, that's literally, you, you reach a point where if you have too many factors, it's tautologically true, and it's not testable. But if you just ask that the number of equations be greater than or equal to the number of unknowns, you get what's called a Letterman bound in this literature. We know that's only, it's not a uh, necessary and sufficient condition, but it's one that uh, uh, it, we're nowhere near. So we're operating within the boundary of that parameter. Okay, so that's just a not so sure to answer your question. Okay, so, uh, so come back to this method. So I don't want to suggest factor analysis, some weirdo scheme here. Uh, so here we can actually come up with an unbiased estimator of the individual factor for each person. So I can literally tell you what's the cognitive trait, the IQ trait, and this is the so-called Bartlett estimator, and literally we, we know what this is, uh, and uh, it's, not, it's not a big issue. We know what the fee is. Now, one last point. What I really want to do is estimate some outcome model. Let me just write the outcome model first. So what is, this is yi, the outcome of agent i, as a function of theta i, and these are other variables as well. So I'm just calling z to be other pre-programmed variables, whatever, whatever is in the, and this was in the context of an analysis. Uh, so we just look at this. So what we're saying is that these thetas are producing these y's. So I've just told you that I've come up with an unbiased estimator of theta. But an unbiased estimator of theta is not good enough because there's measurement error in the theta because there's individual variation. But we actually know what the bias is. Here's the true score. This is the measurement error variance. And I just showed you how we can get the measurement error in those scores. Ergo, and now I'm going to get, I'm, let me go back to my uh, statement here. So I'm going to use the factor scores instead of the true scores to estimate the outcome equations. So even though they're unbiased, there's still a discrepancy because it's an estimate. It's not the true value. But this is a case where we have measurement error, but we know what the nature of the measurement error is. So it's literally something we can identify. And so uh, if you look at it, but I look at the linear parameter regression, this is the, uh, so, so I'm, I'm trying to estimate equation 28. I have unbiased estimates of theta i, but you can see that the error term when I use the estimate, right, from the equation, is going to be this error term here, which is assumed to be orthogonal, plus the measurement error. This is going to be correlated with that, standard measurement error, vector measurement error. So there we go. If I look at the p limb of those, it's alpha and gamma, I'm going to end up with a standard uh, uh, errors and variables formula, just a vector case, where I have theta s, th z, z is assumed not to be measured with error, but theta is measured with error. But the difference between this and the standard measurement error problem is I know the variance covariance matrix of the measurement errors, which means that I can undo the measurement error, which means that I can actually form the alpha. So I actually know everything here, or can know everything here, and unscramble and come up with the true values of alpha and gamma. So this three-step procedure uh, would basically, uh, and this is the argument. I just showed you how to get the covariance of theta. I can get the covariance between z and s, right? Because I observed the z, I just showed you how to estimate the s, so I can form the covariance between z and s. And uh, I'm going to get then that this matrix is identified. Because it's identified, I can actually compute the true coefficients. So it's pre-multiplying this uh, by a inverse. And uh, you can do this. You can also do this through a, a standard least squares procedure, uh, starting at maximum likelihood. But I think this is more intuitive. So it really gets to the heart of what's going on. You have a bunch of measurements. You extract the factor loadings. From the factor loadings, you extract the factors, regressing that on the measurements. And then you put those estimated factor scores into a regression that's explaining some outcome. In this case here, this is my outcome. And that's it, three-step procedure. Now, this, the trouble is in that uh, in this generalizes to general nonlinear systems, but with some complexity. So I don't want to. But this is actually widely used. So PIO, for example, at your retreat, is, uh, is going to be using something like this. OK, so uh, is, this, is there any question on this? Really? Peep? Yes? We will not use the last step. Yeah. Using this correction yes. Can you say anything about the direction? Sure. Right, because you could still compute the bias. Because yeah. you know all the ingredients here. So you can then just say, oh, my attenuation matrix is of A. I can estimate A no matter what whether or not I choose to, to use it or not. Okay? So that's it. Okay. 
so that's, uh, that's the estimator, and uh, we have a paper coming out. Okay, so uh, let me just show you something. So this is the same equation that I keep coming back to. Let me show you some estimates. John Eric will recognize some of these. So I said that the structure of the data is such that to make these models operational, we want to be able to have low dimensional representations of these capabilities. Otherwise, it's tautological, all right? So I've shown you how from a bunch of measurements to compute these capabilities. We actually ended up with 13. Here in this example, we come down to two, clearly an oversimplification, but in the, maybe an oversimplification, okay? But let me show you, this is all using the same set of measurements. And there's a long story, which John and Eric will be happy to talk about over dinner. Uh, but literally, uh, how you can come up with what these measurements are uh, that we use to extract the factors. But the fact is that they are, uh, I think, uh, fairly well justified. So we have this paper, which is under revision now. So let me just give you an example of what this is showing. This is the joint distribution. This is the probability of dropping from secondary school versus graduating. Uh, so you're in secondary school, you're dropping out or you're graduating. You can see you get this nonlinear response surface. Uh, this is in the dimension of social emotional skills, the non-cognitive. These are the cognitive skills. And this is showing how for people who are at very high levels of cognitive and non-cognitive skills, they're almost certain to drop out, I mean, certain to graduate. And uh, low levels, they still have a chance of not uh, dropping out, but it's substantially lower. These are the marginals. So literally, this graph here is just telling you, fixing one at the mean of the other, if I go from the bottom of the distribution to the top, how much more increasing cognitive skills it promotes the probability of graduating, and the same thing is here in terms of graduating. So this is now from a baseline set of cognitive and non-cognitive skills, which we could defend. I mean, there's some, some issue about how you pick the measurement system and ideally, you show a lot of flexibility. But is it understood how we're, how we're getting this? You can think of, what, of doing this literally the way I just showed you. The same skills, the same capabilities are used to explain this, to explain whether you get a four-year degree, to look at log wages, to look at smoking behavior, to look at self-esteem, which many people see as basically being a non-cognitive trait by itself, but this is a measure of self-esteem. Uh, whether or not you vote in the election, uh, whether or not a white collar occupation, uh, what your physical health is at age 40, what your sense of personal mastery is, uh, your mental health, uh, and your depression, uh, and whether you participate in welfare, and finally, do you trust people? I don't know if it's finally, but then being in jail. What's this? These are males. These are males. There's somewhat different pattern for females. Yes. and from early behavior. See, this goes back to this previous notion. See, this is a big difference between economists and psychologists. At least I hope it becomes a big difference. And namely, that if you look at early life behaviors, because of this equation that I keep coming back to, let me, let me keep showing you its latest manifestation. So you'll notice there's a theme. I, don't, I like to say it like a Bach fugue. I'm not sure it's really a little pretentious here, but there at least is a sense of recapitulation and showing you some themes. This is a persistent theme that's going through that literally from behaviors of individuals, risky behaviors in this case here, measured in the teenage years, and then looking at adult behaviors much later on, we can use those behaviors to extract. We also have some big five type measurements in some of these data sets. So it varies in application. Yes? So you are using some of the but early life outcomes. That's, but, you see, but see, that's what I really want to say. So I, I, will be, I will defend this to the end. We have till 6.15, so I'll wear you down. No but, but, but no, but seriously, the distinction that's made by many, see, this is the division of labor that characterizes a lot of work in, in knowledge. Right? You say, these people did their job, so I'm going to take their task. I just told you about the M&M &M studies. I told you... They didn't do their job any better than we did their job. They made some measurement and said, I'm taking, this test measures this. Why is a test any better than behavior, especially in these psychological measurements? All tests are basically performance on some task. 
I finally got this uh, personality psychologist to admit that an IQ test is basically a, your behavior on an IQ test, right? I mean, the M&Ms tell you that. So it's, it's a very important point that you're getting at. So keep objecting. No, no, I'm not asking. I'm trying, trying to browbeat you into submission here. I'm just, what, what, no, it's a very common question. Many psychologists question, and we questioned it ourselves. What's the difference between a test and a behavior? And maybe the behavior is a better indicator of the trait than a test. I mean, I could turn the Klieg lights on or, you know, turn the air conditioning off during a test. Whereas if I look at a sequence of behaviors in early age, now what you're getting at is, oh, maybe this is just a serial, a state-dependent model of, of, uh, of behavior. And so what I'm really getting is state dependence. Right? Yeah. Maybe that's, you shook your head, so. Well, then, yes. Yeah, so I mean, like, cause I, I've been talking to this a lot, and I am suspicious of, you know, written personality tests. Like right. Mm -hmm. Especially personality tests, because in particular, if you imagine you apply on a job, and you ask yourself, are you easy going? Do you get along with others? What are you supposed to say? No, I hate people. I, I really, I dream. Of, no, no, so there's a huge amount of, 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 of gaming in that system. And plus there's also this work that Angela Duckworth has recently talked about. She's working with ETS, where people are self-referential. The example she gives, sorry to pick on Seung, are the Koreans. That, they, that if you ask the Koreans are, are, as a group, are you conscientious? That the, that the Koreans self-reported are some of the least conscientious people in the world across this. And yet their work week is what, 2,400 hours per year, their work year. It's, you know, uh, you know, all other measures suggesting they're not too happy, but they're driven, working very hard, and so forth. So that there is a sense of self-reference. So a lot of the measures aren't so easily, so I don't know whether looking at behaviors is more or less reliable. We've taken the position that the actual behaviors are pretty good guides. Because this theory is telling you, this is just an inverse mapping. If we control for the other factors, then it's a good map, right? It could be a good map. Go ahead. So the idea is kind of like, if, like leading it back to the model, that you have your parents, and they're observing, kind of, and by peeking in their children's behavior, they're, they're, they kind of know the proper model, so they can kind of map it onto these, kind of, to these proper subset of factors. And then from there, they're kind of making these proper adjustments into these different you could think about that. Is the behavior asking, well, there are certain controlling traits. Is the kid staying on task? Is the kid being courteous to others? Is the kid managing aggression and so forth? Those are things that parents would observe. You could think of them as forming an estimate of this theta. In fact, there are versions of the model where the parents are estimating the theta for the child and then producing control response to those inputs. They think, oh, the kid's a rotten little kid. The immediate response is spank the kid or do whatever you do within your own group. So uh, there could be an adaptive response. Yeah, you could think of it that way. But, uh, but all I really want to say is that I don't see any sacred difference between what a test score does, and that's even true of an IQ test. I mean, what's a better measure of IQ? Actually solving a problem or solving a test? I don't know. I mean, solving a problem we think involves other things. A real problem involves other attributes. Anyway, point made. And, uh, but what I'm suggesting is the same low-dimensional set of traits is explaining a bunch of behaviors. And to me, that's suggesting. So it isn't like I make up one trait for one outcome. It's like many outcomes. And I could give you many more outcomes besides these, right? So uh, let me, uh, okay. So now, uh, let me uh, see. Oh, I'm doing okay here. Uh, now. I skipped over the proof. Did anybody want to see the proof of non-parametric identification? It's actually very simple. It's actually, th actually, let me show it to you. I know it sounds terrible, I know. <laughs> but actually it isn't. It's actually very, very simple. Given you understand how I can extract factor scores and estimate distributions of factor scores, then the estimation of the technology non-parametrically is not a big deal. So this is the technology that I talked about, with one addition. I've allowed for measurement error in all these components, but I've allowed there to be multiple measurements on each of the components. So I'm playing my factor game in spades, right? Lots of factors, but that's it. Uh, and then I allow for an innovation eta kt. 
and there are different models that we have for allowing for the investment to be correlated with the ADKT or not. So I, I'll, I'll skip that. It's basically quantile IVs and adaptations of that strategy. But what I'm, and let me take the simplest case where this shock is independent of all these other traits. That could happen if the eta KT is not known at the time the agent is actually making, the parents are making the decisions, and then later it's realized. So that's the kind of standard uh, uh, argument. But we don't, you don't have to make that assumption either, but let me just make it for convenience. And let me make the assumption, that, which is, this is a nonlinear function, that we basically normalize. So if FTJ, which is the protection technology for factor K at time T plus one as a function of this, the whole vector of traits at T, the investment, the parental environment, the government policies, and the shocks. If all that is, uh, is, uh, is specified in this equation here, uh, I want to estimate non-parametrically the FTG without any, any functional form. Okay. But the key idea is really using what I talked about before. We have measurements on all these factors. We have measurement. The, we have measurements on theta t, i, theta p, and theta q. I haven't shown you the measurements on the investments. But in some of the PSID data, certainly in the CNLSY data, we have vectors of measurements. We have multiple, multiple measurements, hundreds of measurements on things like parenting, home scores, things like what the quality of the structure of the environment is. So we have lots of measurements. Okay, which means we have the joint distribution of these measurements from a, like a nonlinear extension of that linear method I just showed you, right? Is that clear? Okay, so if I have that joint distribution and because, look, this is nonparametric, so something has to give, I'm going to normalize the eta to be a uniform random variable. Remember, I'm, asking, I'm estimating ft and theta kt, it's the same kind of point about the factor loading. I have to do some normalizations. In this case here, one normalization that Rosa Motzkin makes is that eta kt is uniform. I can make other assumptions as well, but let me, let me assume that. Then basically, the argument is extremely simple. So does everybody see where I'm going? Does everybody see what I have said so far? I mean, I have to make a normalization if I have this error term. I have an unobserved error term and an unobserved function. <laughs> I, you know, I, something has to be normalized to, to set the scale. So I'm going to set the scale by saying this, I'm just going to use the quantiles of the eta. That's the best I can do. I can tell you the best and the worst, but I can't tell you the absolute value because the, you know, it's basically saying I, I don't know this. Okay, so what can we identify? Well, from the measurements, what I can do because of, say, the, the, this assumption here, what I can do is I can estimate the following distribution here, right? I know the measurements. So I have the theta k's at time t plus 1, and I know what the joint distribution is of theta k being less than or equal to theta bar, theta t, the investment, and theta pt. I can form this joint distribution, right? Right? I mean, maybe not, but do you see? People are looking very blank. I have a bunch of these measurements now. The only thing, only thing I, well, see, this is my mistake. I should have shut up. I know this is a case of uh, getting carried away here. But I can measure each of these things here, right? Possibly with error. I can repeat this analysis, and I can measure them all jointly, which means then that I can actually estimate the joint distribution of this set of unobservables. I can get that, OK? Now, if you give me that, and it's just an analogy to what I did before, then I can form this joint distribution. So I can form the distribution of theta k t plus 1 less than or equal to some number, say theta bar, conditional on things that I observe, right? I can get the joint distribution. I can come up, I don't know the individual components, but I get the joint distribution, right? And I can get the conditional distribution, which is what this is. And that's just going to be literally just using standard notation, the joint distribution evaluated up to some theta bar given these other conditioning variables. But then you just make a, you just make a notation, make a notion that this object here, FSKT, which is the technology I'm trying to get, is basically G inverse of this eta KT, which means then that I can immediately get what eta KT is and immediately identify the entire distribution 
of the technologies non-parametrically, right? So it's just a matter, the only thing that I'm really assuming, other than the normalization of the eta kt, is basically the structure uh, uh, that it's monotone in the eta kt. So I'm assuming monotonicity in the quantiles. So I realized that was a bust. Uh, but you can read it in the Econometrica 2010 paper. It really is just saying the idea that I can invert these functions. Because I know everything except one argument, and it's a monotone function. So I just invert it, the invertibility. That's all that's going on. So I realized it's late, and you've gone, I've gone, I've actually, this is a bad decision for me to go for. <laughs> this is now, I'm into my fifth hour. You must be very sick of me, but this is the last of me, too. And then there's a question about in, in anchoring skills in the interpretal metric. That's going to be basically saying, okay, uh, the skills are, um, are, are, we can actually anchor each of these skills. So instead of using test scores, we can ask how well the test scores predict something that I care about, earnings, education, and the like. That sets the scale on the factor. So I don't have to worry about that. I can think about a, a, a factor that's anchored on something I know. I already talked about the three-step estimation procedure. Uh, and so, uh, and I already talked about these results, which apply these procedures. Uh, and then, uh, then what we actually do, and this may be a letdown after this non-parametric identification proof, is we actually estimate a very parametric looking equation. In fact, it's not only non-parametric looking, it's non-parametric. And it's parametric. I mean, it's very parametric. It's like a CES. Uh, strong assumptions, maybe, about substitution, but a beginning. And so it's a CES production function, and we can estimate that allowing for measurement error. And let me just show you the importance of measurement error. I, I hinted at it, but if you extract what the measurement error components are, you can see that some measurements of like cognitive skills, if you look at the signal uh, and you look at the noise, the noise is basically the yellow, so it's, everything's normalized 100%. You're seeing like here in this uh, gestation link, a measure, you're getting something like 50% signal, 50% error. For some measures, it's down to as little as 30% signal and higher error. So there's a tremendous uh, variation, uh, but measurement error is a non-trivial issue. And if you look at the investments, it's even worse. So you can do this parametrically just because you can simplify? Partly, I mean, it's, look, there's a, there's a sense realistically, but if you estimate a very high dimensional, yeah, we only have a few thousand observations. Anybody who does non-parametrics, they're computational issues. And so, yes, it's sample size in the end. If you had millions of observations, you could get by with it. But it would be very unstable. That's pretty stable, the estimation. But instead of going through parameter estimates particularly, let me just show you what the estimates are. It's a very simplified model, but it's kind of consistent. It takes me back to my two-period framework that I talked about earlier. That's why I want to link it up. So for example, here we have cognitive skill formation. So we're asking, we have two stages, like 0 to 5, and then like 5 to 14. Very, very crude description. Before, we talked about things going at every age, but again, for her current purposes, uh, very simplified. This is the first stage. This is the second stage. This is telling you what's the effect of things like uh, investment. These are parental investments. So the actual numbers maybe aren't so important, but the relative magnitudes are. So we ask, what's the effect of parental investments uh, on uh, a current period? should be parental, not prenatal. Uh, on, on, on next stage parameters, you see very strong effects in the first stage, still statistically significant, but numerically weaker effects. If you ask, what's the implied elasticity of substitution? This is now in cognitive skills, OK? That what you're finding is, that the first stage parameter is finding much a highly, one being Cobb-Douglas, you're way above Cobb-Douglas in terms of the elasticity of substitution. So there's a lot of substitution. And what is that substitution between? Remember I talked about I and theta? That I'm talking, there's a lot of possibility of substitution between theta 1, uh, theta, sorry, uh, theta naught and I1 in my previous notation, right? I had these three periods in the life. So I started the life, and then I had, well, here, let me use the blackboard. People seem to be glazing. Uh, but it's something like theta 2 was equal to f of theta 1, and then this would be i1, uh, and then theta 1, 
I think was going to be, uh, so that's F2, F1, and that's theta naught, and then that's I naught. Maybe I had it slightly, I can't remember what it was, but anyway, what I'm suggesting is these are the elasticity of substitution between those stocks and those investments. And you'll notice what's happening is that there's much more substitutability early in life than there is later in life. That's the sense in which I'm saying we're tending towards complementarity in the estimation of the non-cognitive skill. That's the, the key parameter that showed up. Now, what, what the earlier model that I gave you was a one-skill model, and this is already more general. It's a two-skill model, okay? So, um, and then the, for the non-cognitive skills, we get a, oh, wait, and there's another factor, too. That non-cognitive skills are playing a powerful role, right? That the non-cognitive skills, there's a strong, at least in the first period, a cognitive cross effect. That non-cognitive skills are affecting cognitive skills, and there's a fairly strong a cross effect. So when the skills are cross-fostering each other, it's the stocks of skills. So there's actually yet another argument. This is my scalar argument. We could have a theta 1c and a theta 1 non-c. So we put both of those in there. We're getting strong effects, at least in the first stage. If you do the same thing for the formation of non for, for non-cognitive skills by our measure, what you're getting is that, uh, yeah, you're getting uh, strong investment effects, and again, weaker in the second period than the first, look at what the elasticities of substitution is. They're more or less the same in the first period and the second period. That's suggesting it's still low, by the way. Remember, the other estimate for cognition was extremely high. It was like the elasticity was like 2. Here it's 0.6, but it hasn't changed that much, and now it's higher than actually for non-cognitive. So this is now giving you a sense in which it's easy to substitute early and by investment versus the stock in these two-stage technologies, okay? And so what that's suggesting is that any evidence of kind of increasing complementarity is, is very minimal. I mean, we've gone from 0.682 to 0.657, well within the range of uh, standard error. And the other main point is basically that non-cognitive skills are important, uh, uh, are, are not, are, are, are uh, important, Sorry, cognitive skills are not very important in actually fostering non-cognitive skills. Okay, so that's, that's the structure of, of what we found uh, from these estimates. Now, you kind of give you lots of estimates, uh, but let me try to interpret what the estimates mean. So self-productivity becomes stronger as children become older. Complementarity between cognitive skills and investments becomes stronger. So the complementarity, remember, is the same as the synonym for it becomes more difficult to substitute cognitive with investments. So the, the cognitive deficits, tend, and that's consistent with the rank evidence of correlation, uh, of rank stability of the correlation. Uh, and so uh, complementarity between cogn non cognitive investments becomes slightly weaker as children become older, uh, and, uh, and so forth. So we ask, how much do we explain of the total variation? So we have basically the 34% of the variation educational attainment is explained by measures of cognitive and non-cognitive abilities. That's pretty substantial for est estimates of the size. Still, leaves a lot unknown. 16% due to cognitive abilities, 12% due to non-cognitive abilities, and uh, th they're powerful, but there are other factors at work. Okay, so that's what the estimates are showing. Let me give you, instead of talking about the estimates per se, let me consider the kind of social planner's problem. Oh, yes. Can you talk a bit more on what It's again, some of these same measures of, these are like more like the behavioral problems index that I was putting up earlier. These are these are measured at a somewhat earlier age in the adolescent years. Yes, go ahead. No, these are younger children. I mean, there aren't many kids committing violent crimes at age uh, seven. There are some, unfortunately, but uh, not many. So what it is is more like assessments that are made of teachers and of others of the child's behavior. I mean, there's a whole literature about whether you should use teacher ratings, should you use parents' ratings. Self-report at age four is not the best. You know, you ask a kid, are you uh, uh, conscientious and so forth. So these are more like measures of teachers and outside observers of things like the conscientiousness of the child. And it's terribly aggregative because we're piling together lots of 
traits. If you had the big five with its facets, you would have 30 factors. We boil all that down to one, which is like an abuse of, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a huge aggregation issue. But it does consist of these parental, sorry, these, um, these third party assessments of the child's behaviors. But it would, it's, it's kind of a mishmash in that sense. You want, I mean, it's in the paper. I can, yeah. can go through it. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, I'm about to answer that. Again, remember, this is a simplified analysis. In principle, from what we found with Gabriella, we'd have 13 components instead of one for the non well, 12, I guess. We had 12 non-cognitive components and, and one, no, I'm sorry, in terms of non-cognitive is about eight, right? We had many components and one cognitive, one cognitive. One cognitive, one else, so, so 11, okay. Non-cognitive. But um, I'll show you in particular when I get to the Perry study, because I want to link these studies, and we got to get to the health. So actually, I, I really, Gabrielle has some interesting things to say, besides I'm sure you'd like a different voice. So measured parental investment. So again, there are multiple outcomes that we're trying to predict. And so let me just show you. So let's take the kind of social planner policy was a special case of one of Steve's examples earlier, just trying to maximize aggregate output, which is one of the criteria that I guess would be a welfareist position, uh, doing cost-benefit analysis, trying to measure aggregate output. I'm not even sure it's utilitarian. We haven't gotten there. We're just looking at what the maximum output would be. But I wanna, uh, I wanna consider a social planner whose goal is to try to maximize aggregate output or to minimize aggregate harm, like crime. So you wanna maximize ag education or minimize. So one of the implications that came out of the estimates, it doesn't, it's not necessarily a theorem, but it's kind of a theorem in the sense that it's kind of consistent in any way with the empirical pattern of the evidence, is that if we really want to uh, estimate and maximize aggregate education, one of the findings is that even though we built in this kind of, uh, kind of uh, a relationship, a CES type relationship, uh, we still find that the optimal policy, and this is what this graph is showing, this optimal policy is actually showing that we want to invest relatively more of our output uh, into disadvantaged children, even if our goal is to maximize output. Now you can ask why is that? I'll give you a, a calculation in a minute. But So that's, that's one thing. Uh, so for the most disadvantaged, the optimal policy is to invest relatively more than in the advantage. And so this gives me back to my example. Unfortunately, I've changed the, the, the dates, theta 3, theta 2, but it's the same kind of example. And let me just give you a very simple model. We start with early endowments, in this case theta 1. We have early investment and we have late investment. So here are my, my two stages, kind of like here, but I'm now using G and F instead of F superscript 1 and F superscript 2. And suppose that we adopt the following technology. This is like a CES technology with a scale parameter and with, a, uh, uh, and, and with the substitution parameters. So we have A1, uh, A2. That should be an A2, I believe, as well, even though it's a sigma. And these are the standard parameters. So this is the elasticity of substitution. So if we ask, what is the complementarity or substitution parameter? It's the difference between DJ and AJ. Now, what I showed you from the estimates, and again, this is a broad interpretation, is that in the early stages, like in stage one up here, we're much closer to and maybe at the stage of complement. Remember, we can get, we can still, uh, sorry, substitute early on. 
So you can still substitute relatively well. The elasticity of substitution was above 2, which is a pretty high level. Of, not infinity, not like in the standard literature, but a fairly high level. So in the first stage, we can substitute, or that's, that's the stage theta 2 now in this first stage. In the later stage, it shrunk now in terms of cognition. So it became much less likely. So if we look at the elasticity, so what I'm suggesting is the evidence for cognitive skills is suggesting something along the following lines, that, in, that this complementarity relationship early and substitution later. But now that could still end up with a notion of complementarity or substitution in the aggregate. So that's what, uh, when you substitute into these two equations. So, uh, so there, and this is just the three notions of complementarity that I mentioned before. Namely, uh, we're finding this, this, this is the, in, in period one, period two, and then the complementarity in I1 and I2. These are three conceptually different parameters. They're related to each other, but they're different, right? And so what I'm saying is we probably found in the early stage complementarity in the later stage, and it suggests a switch from substitute to complement for investment which is just sort of formally in the CES framework saying it's getting harder and harder to compensate for, non -co for cognitive skills. But for non-cognitive skills, it's still relatively easily between easy to substitute and so forth. So if the social planner is trying to maximize the sum of outputs between two individuals with different initial conditions, then it can be optimal in this case here to actually compensate for disadvantage. It's more effective than later investment. Okay, you have a choice. I want to spend a bundle. Where should I spend it? I spend it in time when substitution is high. Let me give you a vivid example that puts together different themes. And I do want to switch on to health here very shortly. But if you look, for example, at, uh, at the ratio of early to late investments, we solve out the problem. We now, I'm showing you two different problems. I gave you the parameters for the parameter looking at maximizing education, showed you some graphs. Maybe a little too cryptic. But the idea is that for education, uh, what we're finding for both education and for crime is that, that it's optimal for most people. There's a distribution here because I'm, we're really estimating a distribution of characteristic. So a uniform policy is not optimal. The targeting should be on individual traits. And what we find, for example, in the crime example, that the ratio of early to late is still the, the median here uh, the mode of the distribution is above 1, but there's a tail here below 1, which saying that early might be less than uh, late, actually, in terms of optimal targeting. But now if we look at the difference between education and crime, you'll notice the education distribution shifted to the right. Why would that be? Or remember that we have this principle of comparative advantage, that these functionings, whether they're crime or education, load differently on cognitive and non-cognitive factors. Cognitive factors are far more important in producing education than in crime. The non-cognitive components are relatively less important. Uh, they're still important. They still play a big role, but relatively less important. So now think about it for a second. Remember that the effectiveness of investment is declining in the cognitive component. So if your goal is to maximize education, you would want to upload more of your investment into early versus late. For the same bundle of outputs, if your sole goal is to maximize crime, uh, minimize crime, then basically what you'd do is, is you would substitute a little more evenly. Question, yes? Could I clarify a question? Is your, your investment um, aggregate, is that meant to measure parental investment? Only, OK, that's a very good question. No. See, what I've minimized here, and this goes back to a key ingredient missing in much of the literature. It's still missing. I mean, there's a very interesting but limited set of papers and people correct me, I mean, I'm, I want to learn from you very much, so please tell me if there, I've already heard about some references I didn't know. What I'm assuming in this calculation, it's a very good point, is that I'm assuming that the government is actually making this investment and there's no parental response. There's an open question about whether or not in response to the investment by the government, parents will add or will substitute. And the literature is not completely and there isn't that, that big a literature. I know of two or three papers on it. Maybe somebody can tell me about more recent papers. It's a very active area. The question is, again, is it complementary or substitution? Becker has a very old paper 
suggesting why Head Start didn't work, instead of the notion that it was non-cognitive traits, his theory was basically, oh, uh, that there was compensation. The government gave, and then the parents took out so that Head Start is just substituted resources. But others have actually found evidence that if you give resources, parents respond. And so parents, so, but it's an open question. I don't know, I know of two or three papers. Do you know of any uh, recently? A lot of studies, people have talked about it. But what I've minimized in these calculations is the parental response, which could make these things stronger or weaker. So if parents can undo everything that children, that the government's doing, then everything I just said is worthless because there's really another factor out there. And so the treatment effects are going to be inclusive of that. We actually have evidence from the, from the experimental studies, right, from the Perry and the ABC studies, some work that we're doing, showing that it tends to be, especially mothers with girls, right, reinforcing. And so, right, so that's a, that's a very strong, uh, uh, but we haven't, uh, that doesn't appear here on this graph. So it's an open question. So we have a new evidence on, on this notion of reinforcing behavior. I mean, there's a whole literature about why there'd be reinforcing behavior. These models have a very mechanical flavor. You know, we have endowments, we have investments, it sounds good. But then you think about what's going on, you could say, well, what actually happens is, um, whether or not you have home visits or not, the child is showing a certain amount of ability and motivation and curiosity as a result of, say, getting this investment, say, at a, an external center, the parents might respond. So here's this little bright, bubbly kid. The parents are now suddenly going to be bright and bubbly in response. So the child evokes the response. But that's, that's off uh, another point. So here we can actually see that in this case here, at least for these examples, and what seems to be the empirically relevant case is that what Sin, who is focusing mainly on the structure of inequality and, and, and trying to provide equality of opportunity in a basic sense, and the human capital approach based on economic efficiency come together. That's what's socially fair it seems to be also efficient. So let me talk very briefly, because I do think we should talk about health. So Gabrielle, I promise you we will talk about health. But let me talk very briefly. But yes? No. It was just a rationalization of the evidence. Yeah, there is evidence. Now you can actually attest that with the new Head Start data. You can actually test, right, whether it's compensation or reinforcement on the part of parents. And there was a study, right? the study on Head Start that was consistent. What? The recent study. Who are the authors? There were two at Penn. Gelber and uh, Kuma? Oh, Iza. OK. So, and that was actually finding. Uh, uh, respond. Yeah, respond more. So that there, tends, there typically tends to be this complementarity of response. So whatever the government says, go ahead. Yes. Is that the time? Time and frequency of interest that we are getting from the government. Yeah. So again, it's but it's a huge question, and and again, and the question is going back to the Cunha issue and the question of what's known. Um, it could be, you know, when you think about what these interventions are, the intervention, the trouble with the model is the the, the evidence is that we can't separate out what feature of what Head Start caused this. Because Head Start does have some parental visits, and it has directly inputs into the child. So we don't know that it's an evocative response from the child or whether or not it's an input uh, into the parent, just telling them how to be, uh, what kind of dimensions could stimulate your parent. That's, so that's an open question. But let me talk very briefly, because the literature has hundreds of treatment effects. There's some recent studies by Curry and Almond summarizing health effects and also recent studies by Almond and Mazumdar. There are a lot of studies, uh, and I, I haven't really, I'm assuming those as background um, in the literature. But it's important to understand when we look at this literature that when we try to look across different treatment effects, we have different target populations, we have different curricula, we have different measurement systems, and the methods of evaluation differ. So we have randomized trials, we have matching studies, we have regression discontinuity designs and so forth. And we also uh, think we need to compare policies and alternative and comparable metrics. Uh, so you have to move beyond treatment effects. And uh, so let me just say that. Let me show you an example of something uh, that we're actively engaged in. We are now the 
principal, I, I read about this program about 13 years ago, and now I'm a <laughs> principal investigator, a co-principal investigator of uh, the Perry at 50 study. So Perry it was a program that started in the 1960s, before it had to start, targeted towards disadvantaged, low-income African-American children, targeted with IQs below 85. Um, but the population average was 85, so it wasn't that restrictive, but it was still a low IQ population. It was actually below 80 was supposed to be, but it, they, they were certainly some over 85. The program, I mean, the details may be not so important, but I want to lay out a couple of key notions. And this gets to the idea of mentoring, which I think is a huge role. So what we found is that the Perry Preschool was two and a half hours per day, five days a week, uh, two years at ages three and four, home visits, stops after two years. But what was the curriculum? See, the, the thing is, is we take these experiments as being kind of black boxes. But we ask, what's really going on there? Well, it's not a black box. The kids were actually brought in, and actually there's amazing commonality between this and ABC, to do what's called plan, do, review. They came in each day, they planned a topic, they planned, or they planned a particular uh, study, project, they actually did it, and then they review it. It could be a very simple project. Build a toy, paint a picture, write a, or sketch something, very simple. Uh, and they did it, and then they would re review it collectively. And there was a fairly small classroom a pupil-teacher ratio. It was like, what, it's at this stage, three to four, it was like, what, four or five to one? Or three to one? Three or four. Three or four to one, yeah. So it's like getting close to what a family, what a, what a mother uh, might do in supervising the child's literature. So there's random assignment. There, there's a literature out there that claiming it only works for, for girls. It's just not true. There's strong effects for boys and girls. Uh, but what it did is it had this effect. So this is the fade out that I talked about before. At age three, they enter with almost identical IQs, a little bit higher for treatment. It surges during the early years. Then it basically comes down. By age nine or 10, you're finding basically there's no statistically significant difference on this IQ. So this is the multiple skills notion that I was trying to get at. If you evaluated this only by an achievement test or an IQ test, or sorry, an IQ test, this is a failure. This is exactly what Arthur Jensen saw in the Head Start data and pronounced it a failure. And out of that came a whole theory of why blacks were doomed and actually, Hernstein and Murray, I think, formalized or tried to provide data to support the Jensen view. Don't you think? If you look at the chronology, I think we look at 30 years trying to explain the fade out. Yet, if you evaluate the cost benefit, and Seung, more than any human on Earth, is responsible for the evaluation, if you look at the, eva if you look at the benefit cost ratio, which you can follow now, these kids are now into their 40s, and now they're going to be 50 when you collect the next round of data that you find that it has a statistically significant return of 7 to 10 percent per annum. So whether you look at rates of return or benefit cost ratios, they're substantial. And they're statistically significant for both boys and girls. And it's in a range that's at least around what the stock market return was between 1945 and 2008, uh, September, when the meltdown occurred. So you're getting a very high economic return. And so what was the behavior? Well, it turned out, we visited Perry, we could actually look at teacher ratings, which hadn't been so well studied, right, before we looked at them. And so just looking at the raw data, you found that personal behavior improved for treatment versus control, okay? And uh, you look at measure of social emotional index, aggression and so forth, turns out to be very important. Now, again, I mentioned Terry Moffat much earlier about the MAOA gene. She's also done a lot of work on the emergence of aggression. She found and that severe aggression in, in children typically will start emerging at ages three to four, exactly the time that Perry was targeting these kids. So this is a population, low IQ kids at risk. We have a very high murder, well, we have a very high crime rate, right? What's the average number of crimes per treatment group, per, per control group member? We had some people had as many as 150 convictions, right? And that's one of was identified by the psychologist that Moffat found this high core. So this group targeted. I don't know Moffat's work came much later when this program, but it targeted those people. 
and it targeted towards some of these same soft skills or not so soft skills, uh, uh, anger uh, uh, control and so forth. So uh, in fact, that was a big factor here, right? That we could actually reduce. Uh, so actually using the same methodology that I sketched in terms of the factor models, you can actually decompose the treatment effects. So here are the treatment effects. You know, in a, in a bunch of papers, we've actually looked at uh, the structure of, uh, of, uh, of outcomes. So these are achievement test scores. These are uh, misdemeanor arrest, felony arrest, tobacco, uh, lifetime arrest. This table is slightly out of date. We also, oh, here are monthly income. We have a bunch of different measures. It's pretty much up to date. So you can decompose what fraction. So we actually have the measured factors that we extract using exactly these methods I talked about earlier. We can actually show. So we have the measurements, but we can also extract factors and things that have to do with cognition, externalizing behavior, and academic motivation. And what we found was that a big chunk of the treatment effect, by no means all, it's just the shaded, the, not the gray, but the, uh, in this case, the blue, the green, or the red, that chunk is actually explained by increases between the treatment and control group in these factors. Question? Well, now be careful. In, in, in reporting these effects, let me, I didn't state this, and it's a part of uh, one of our papers. Uh, there are a lot of, I mean, there's always a danger. I mean, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of outcomes. I don't know how many total outcomes are there with Perry. 4,000? So you have 4,000 outcomes and 120 observations. That's a field day. You can say, ah, I'm going to find a few statistically significant findings. I'm going to, what's called cherry picking. All of these adjust for multiple hypothesis testing. So we're allowing for that kind of dependence within blocks. So it, we are. So I understand what you're saying. So the trouble is that if you form factors, you can get some very arbitrary components in terms of the outcome. Here, these are interpretable outcomes. There are a lot of factors where it's not statistically significant. We're going to talk about the health effects. Whoops. I better talk real fast here. Similar effects for females, not quite the same. Uh, and if you look, for example, at the health effects, let me just talk very briefly. Again, we're seeing a uh, reduction in uh, cigarette smoking. Uh, we're seeing a reduction in various kinds of unhealthy behaviors. And it turned out the ABC study, and we'll talk a lot more about this in a minute, but the ABC, I'm just going to show one table, Gabriella, don't worry, um, that literally what was really surprising to us, and these are new results, pretty new results, that the ABC had a curriculum that turns out to overlap at ages three to four is something very similar to Perry. Very surprising. If you look at the description, it looks like a much more intensive program and so forth. But it had the same core, it's part of the same core curriculum. Now you go out and ask, oh, what happens? Well, if you look at systolic blood pressure, probably not many of you are worried about your blood pressure right now. You're too young. Uh, but believe it or not, 140 is the barrier for hypertension. And you can actually see that the systolic blood pressure for the treatment group is 125 within normal range. The systolic for the control is 143. If you look, for example, the pre-hypertension, we're getting fewer people in the pre-hypertension. Diastolic readings are favorable. And then the so-called metabolic syndrome, which is a precursor for things like diabetes, right, and the other risks, you're finding the control group is really seriously exposed. The treatment group is not. So you're getting substantial differences in these, uh, in these structures. And again, what's the mechanism? We haven't done the full analysis yet like we did for Perry, but you think about it, if you go back to the, the example about functionings, we changed by these programs, the cognitive, non-cognitive uh, skills, as well as the, now the health skills. And some of this has to do with the behavior of individuals, how well they control themselves. BMI is also lower, uh, cholesterol is lower, there's this healthier behaviors, and, and this is measured now at age 34, 35. Okay, so let me just talk very briefly. I'm going to talk about integrating family, and let me skip through this. Um, I don't think, uh, I would say this, that if we start thinking that these different interventions are integrating, are actually operating through changing this vector of capabilities, and these capabilities affect a bunch of outcomes, 
we have a lever to compare studies that are very different from each other. So we can control for things like, so it's, see the trouble is the treatment effects, if I just take the raw treatment effect, if I'm ending up with like uh, very different populations uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and so forth, I'm, I'm not going to be able to easily to integrate this. But using the estimation of this model, this model, this dynamic state space model, allows us to integrate the observational studies, which I showed you a minute ago from the, the data that estimated with Cunha and Chinook was not, uh, 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 not uh, an experiment, with the experimental studies. This is the Perry level finding. So let me just show you an example. So this gives you a baseline what the control group in Perry was getting. These are the high school graduation rates, something like 41 percent. Enrollment in college, 4 percent. 22 percent conviction rates, 21, 22 percent probation, 17 percent on welfare. So we ask, okay, look, what does the treatment group actually do? Turns out this is what the treatment group gets. We can ask, suppose we estimate the technology of skill formation, use exactly the estimates I just reported, and ask, suppose we now look at moving from the fourth decile of the distribution to, uh, uh, sorry, from the initial conditions, see I'm getting tired, through early investments. If I focused only on early investments, I can actually achieve Perry type results by this change. So I change the initial because we move to kids, they're at the bottom of the distribution and I move them to the fourth decile. I can actually achieve in terms of investments. So I can actually achieve then uh, Perry like results and I'm getting that off from the technology estimated before. Now I can do a counterfactual and say, oh, here's the adolescent intervention. I'm going to focus all my resources on, I'm going to ask, what do I need to be able to achieve the Perry like results if I instead try to remediate in later life? Well, I could still do that, but now it's going to be 35% more costly in present value terms. So in that sense, I can actually use the technology, go back and invert, and ask how costly is it to use one strategy versus the other. And now the counterfactual for Perry would be to say, suppose that I use the same amount of money I spent here, which is 35% more than here, and spread it evenly over the life cycle using the optimal technology under the same assumptions I had before, and then I could achieve something like 91% high school graduation rates. So there's some speculative elements in this. But what I'm suggesting is this gives us a way to integrate the experimental studies with the non-experimental studies through the common coin of the capabilities, right? How these different technologies, how these different interventions are changing technologies, whether it's family influence or whether it's the influence of the uh, intervention program. Okay. So let me just talk very briefly. There, there are some studies. I really should skip this. Uh, this is the causal effect of education on capabilities. This is more in the adolescent years. Uh, we have an earlier paper in 2006 uh, with uh, Stiegsrud and Ertzua where we actually exploit a certain feature of the, of the NLSY. The feature of the NLSY is that it's an enrollment in a particular program. Sorry, it, it, they ask education at a given date and time. Uh, at a given date, which is 1979, and they look at the test score in 1979, uh, those kids are at between 14 and 21, right? So they have different levels of education. And then we can condition on final education, say at age 30, and ask, given the education they achieved and conditioning on final test score, and given that some people were at different stages of education, we can, under plausible conditions, we estimate both a structural model and one that actually just exploits the fact that if we condition on final level of education uh, for individuals, uh, we can control, or under plausible conditions, can control for any selective differences. We can use the fact that some people were at eight years of school, some were at nine years of school, some were at 10 years of school, on subsamples of individuals, say all of whom had, say, 16 years of school, finally, say at age 30. And we can look at how that education affected cognitive and non-cognitive test scores. And uh, that's what these charts show. So we see big effects on cognition, not surprising. 
uh, and also effects on uh, two measures of non-cognitive skills. Uh, here is, uh, do you want to talk about this, Gabriella? I'm starting to fade and, no, no, I'm, I've been talking for hours, literally. I got to, I may collapse uh, here, but uh, the, the question is now just going to health. So we'll, we'll conclude this presentation with health and Gabriella will talk about some aspects of this. Uh, this is from some other study where we actually look at the effect of education. This is post-compulsory education in British data using the British cohort study 1970 and asking how much is the total effect. So here, this, here's an example. Let me show you the graph. So if we look at the total effect of what uh, completing post, post, it's different between males and females. The whole height of the bar is the total effect of just going beyond post-compulsory schooling uh, in England uh, on uh, wages. Uh, this is on employment. This is on exercise. This is on obesity. This is poor health, depression, smoking. And so what we actually see is we can actually break out how much is this due to the causal effect of education itself, which is this piece in orange, uh, the lighter piece, and how much of it is due to early life factors. Well, early life is around age 10, so it's not really early life, but it's early, relatively early life. And we can see very important components due to each source. There is a causal effect of education, but there's also a causal effect of early, earlier education up through age 10 and some of these early life factors. So, um, ah, boy, I think you should talk. I mean, I, I, I will talk very, this is basically the Atlanta talk. So I can, uh, so there's a large literature looking at IV estimates and I feel like I'm gonna suddenly open up a whole new frontier here and I, let me just assert something. We know, and this is some work with Vitlicil, this is a simulation from a paper with Philip Eisenhower but it's uh, the same idea. Uh, we know, for example, oops, that different IVs estimate different margins of adjustment. And uh, if we have like two potential outcomes, say treated and untreated, the marginal treatment effect is the gain between treated and untreated, conditional and unobservable. These are the relevant unobservables. Uh, these unobservables could actually, could lie in the factor space that we talked about earlier. It could also be that the factor, that the space of unobservables is bigger. And if we assume we also have instruments, that we can actually check the factor model with the instrumental variable model to see whether the estimates coincide. Uh, but in general, we know that IV, different instruments identify different segments of this marginal treatment effect. Late is basically going to be um, some weighted average uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the uh, of the marginal treatment effects over different regions uh, where the weights could be zero or would in general be zero for certain regions. So let me just show you by way of example since I'm starting to fade rather badly. He's walking out to protest. <laughs> now, I don't, I don't mind, I, I'd like to walk out too. But the, the marginal treatment effect is basically showing this pattern of declining. So in terms of, this should be UD, should be showing declining a marginal gain as I move from the bottom to the top of the distribution. These are two different instruments. And so different instruments are basically putting different weights on this MTE. So I gave you example where the marginal treatment effect is the same. The eight is 0.1 and that different instruments, uh, see this is using the, the, uh, the, let me just say two different instruments. This is the propensity score and this is basically another instrument. Uh, the estimates that come out are exactly 0.1 here in this first case and a minus 1.014 in the other case. This, these instruments are overweighting the bottom of the distribution and give you actually a negative estimate even though the, estimate, the other estimate is, uh, is, is the true eight is positive. So we know that different instruments identify different parameters. Using the factor model, we can, and we can actually check which instrument is, uh, which, wh which, which margins of the different instruments are basically identifying. And here's an example, but I, I think I'm, uh, I think we can actually uh, switch over to health. Why don't we switch to early life health, okay?